20. Atonement and Action Hebrews 9, 18-28 Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 18-28 The references in our text to the making of the covenant are to Exodus 24 and 34. This was a testament or covenant in blood, half of which was sprinkled on the altar, and half on the people, Exodus 24, 6-8. This set forth the covenant vow of both parties, God and the covenant people, to be faithful unto death to the covenant and the covenant law. This Exodus covenant is called the first, verse 18, because it is the first with a people as a whole and not restricted to a man and his family. In verse 19, we are told that Moses gave, quote, every precept, end quote, of the law to the people before sprinkling the book and all the people. The book refers to the covenant law book. This is material new to us, but apparently well known, that is, that the covenant laws given to Moses on the mount were also sprinkled. We are given the laws other than the Ten Commandments after the ratification of the covenant. Apparently, the Ten Commandments, as the summary of the whole law, represented all the law. The text indicates that every commandment had been spoken to all the people, which may have been the case before the ratification by blood. Moses, in so doing, declared, quote, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Verse 20. These words were echoed at the Last Supper by Jesus, quote, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, 1 Corinthians 11.25, and their meaning was inescapable to the disciples. This blood, quote, God hath enjoined unto you, end quote, or purposed for you. Moses, quote, sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, verse 21. This is partly described in Acts only when the sanctuary was first built was symbolic sprinkling done. In verse 22, we are told that, quote, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission, that is, of sin. Quote, almost, end quote, means that in some instances, such as Exodus 19.10, purification was all that was required. Other examples are Exodus 32.30-32, Leviticus 15.5, 16.26-28, 22.6, Numbers 16, 46 to 48, 31, 23 following, Psalm 32, 1 following, 51, 1 to 17. In verse 23, we are told that the two sanctuaries, the one on earth and the one in heaven, require purification before men can have access to God. The earthly sanctuary can be cleansed by means of these typical sacrifices, the blood of bulls and of goats, but the heavenly sanctuary requires much more the atoning sacrifice of Christ. 
The earthly sanctuary typifies access to God, while the heavenly sanctuary is the reality. Therefore, only Christ's atonement affects for us the perfect access to the triune God. The penalty for sin is death. Jesus Christ, as our representative and federal head, provides himself as our vicarious substitute to die for our sins. The Levitical system is a shadow of the reality and cannot be given priority above Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Neither temple nor church can make of itself either a closed door or the true access. Verse 24 tells us that the true cleansing power belongs to the blood of Jesus Christ. The earthly sanctuary was made by hands. Christ did not enter into the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, but in heaven to make effectual atonement for us and to represent us in the very presence of God. We are constantly and continually before God because his very face in the person of Jesus Christ so that we are never forgotten nor can be. In verses 25 and 26, we are told that while there is perpetual intercession, verse 24, there is no continuing sacrifice as with the Levitical priesthood. The high priests of the Levitical line had to make an annual and typical atonement. They offered not their own blood, but the blood of the sacrificial animals. Their sacrifices required repetition because they were not forever effectual. Now, at the consummation of the ages, M. R. Vincent, rather than, quote, the end of the world, end quote, Jesus Christ set forth the goal, the true atonement whereby the new human race is created and the new heavens and earth begun. Sin has been put away from us and the power of death broken. Jesus Christ, the eternally existent one, compare 1 Timothy 3.16, was, from all eternity, our appointed Redeemer. In verses 27 to 28, we are told that it is, quote, appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, end quote. Christ's redeemed people see him, quote, a second time, end quote, as the sinless one who saved his people. As judge, he will award eternal salvation to his people, The fullness of salvation is brought in by his coming at the end of history. The goal of Christ's first coming was atonement. Our sins are forgiven and we are made his new human race. Our goal is now given to us as in Matthew 28, 18-20, to disciple all nations, teaching them all things which our Lord commands and bringing all things into captivity to Christ our King. The goal of Christ's second coming is to bring in the fullness of his kingdom. The theology of salvation has now been given to us. Beginning in chapter 10, Hebrews goes on to apply this salvation to our daily lives. The purpose of Jesus Christ, God the Son, is not to enhance the Levitical sacrifices, but to declare that atonement is the prelude to service. God, therefore, is not satisfied with the forms of sacrifice, 10.5, but he tells us that our lives must reflect that of the servant's son who says, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do all thy will, O God. 10.7 We are given this strong statement and warning because the church, like the temple and synagogue, gets easily wrapped up in its own life rather than life in Christ. The forms of worship replace faithfulness and service, and the church, in effect, makes an end of itself. In chapters 11 and 12, Hebrews strongly stresses the living faith of past saints to separate us from an institutional piety and unto faith at work in the world. We are shown that faith is never abstracted from the context of life and its challenges and problems. The Epistle of James is rightly placed after Hebrews because both stress faith with works James 1, 22-27, 2, 14-26. Atonement leads to action, not to withdrawal and retreat. 